Hey, everybody. Welcome to Yes, We're Here. Michael Kay here, along with my broadcast partner and friend, David Cohn. And David, today we, we would be packing, and tomorrow we would be leaving to head to Baltimore for opening day. And it seems so weird. What are your thoughts on this? It almost seems surreal. Well, it really does seem surreal. It, it's almost as if baseball's taken a back seat, and rightly so, over the, the, the health of our of our fans, of, of our citizens, of everybody. So yeah, it's kind of hard to, uh, to predict or to look forward uh, when, when you're just uh, day to day as we all are right now, collectively trying to figure out what the next move's gonna be. Now, obviously, when we talk about baseball, we put it in the context of what it is. It's a distraction. And as David said, the most important thing, obviously, is the health of our nation, the health of the planet. Uh, but we will talk about baseball a little bit, so please don't take that the wrong way. David, you were part of a work stoppage uh, in 95, and obviously the World Series was called off in 94. You had that second spring training after the replacement players. How long did it take you guys to ramp up and be ready to play the season if, in fact, they play a season this year? You know, I sort of equated to, uh, you know, 1995. Once, uh, once the strike was over, we did about a three-week spring training camp. It was an abbreviated spring training. Uh, I would imagine that's what we're looking at right now, you know, depending on how this shakes down and, you know, it, it's so unpredictable as we mentioned before, but you, just for argument's sake, if you said, uh, you know, May 1st, June 1st, July 1st, no matter what, once you get into that territory, the players are going to, are going to need at least three weeks of spring training to get back up to speed and get the pitching staffs where they need to be to, to pitch normal games. If the pitchers, they were, get, they were close to getting ready. They were two weeks away from, from the season starting. So if they're out two months, are they back to zero or do they still retain some of what they built up in spring training? I think you retain a little bit. You know, a normal spring training is six weeks, and that's mainly for the pitchers. The hitters are usually ready to go by about the month point, about four weeks. So, you know, I would say, yes, you know, you do retain a little bit of what, what was going on with the – the players are probably throwing on their own somewhere, although it's uh, that's questionable as a lot of the players have dispersed and gone back home. Some have stayed in Tampa, so it's, it's hard to get a read on, you know, the, the, the physical health of the arms of the pitchers right now, but you would need at least three weeks, in my opinion, to get those, especially the starting pitchers, back up to speed. All right, let, let's say that you, you were playing at this point and you decided to go home. Could you get a workout in because, you know, social distancing, you're holding a baseball, you don't want somebody else to hold it. Could you get a workout thrown against the wall? Could you get your arm in shape just doing that or stay in shape? Uh, to, to a certain degree, yes. I mean, uh, you know, I did that myself. You know, when I came back from my aneurysm, uh, the doctors didn't okay me to throw and I just wouldn't wait. So I actually took a baseball and started throwing it against the side of a brick wall. Uh, on my own, kind of hiding, doing doing it uh, against doctor's orders. And I, I think you remember, Michael, when I, you know, I came back from that aneurysm. You know, I made two minor league rehab appearances, and then started that game in Oakland on, on the second of September. So, uh, yeah, you can, but it's not the same. You know, there's no simulation for game game type situations. Uh, the this, the in between innings, the up and the down, the the stress innings, the runners on base, you know, everything that happens during the game just cannot be simulated in practice. I had Mariano Rivera on my radio show the other day, and he said, you can't have a 60-game season. He said, that's not real legitimate champion to find, to find a team. What would you say is the minimum amount of games that you feel comfortable that they played? You know, I think that takes the back seat. You know, that is the least of my worries. You know, and if you look at the history of baseball, whether it was wartime back in the 40s when you saw a lot of our major league players join the service and lose a lot of their careers, or whether it was on into more recent history in 9-11. You know, baseball should come back for the, for the sake of, of, of the fan base, for the sake of the country, whenever that is. It doesn't matter how long the season is. When we're ready to play baseball, when fans are ready to see baseball, we should play baseball. Uh, just, just for the – just for the, the – the health of it all for, for people that need a distraction for people that need to see baseball for some sort of uh, the sense of back to normalcy, or at least baseball is trying to help lead us back to normalcy. I could care less how many games we play when it's time to play baseball. We go out on that field, we play baseball 
for the nation, and, and we do it like we always have uh, throughout the course of history. Now, you, you were you know, very active in the union and a player rep as well, David. So I'm wondering if they have to squeeze half the season, but they want to get as many games because the players want to get paid and the owners want to get paid, you think the players would agree to a doubleheader every week? I think the players would be very amenable at this point. I think that there's a shared burden that's going on here uh, by everybody. That, you know, that we're all in this together is the overriding message that, that uh, what, what this crisis has, has sent throughout the world. So, yeah, I mean, that now is the time to, to, uh, to, to come to the table and, and do what needs to be done and to, to be uh, compatible, to be, you know, uh, the, the, to, to compromise, I guess is the right word. If you need to compromise and do whatever is necessary to, to get the product back on the field at the right time, and if that means double headers uh, every weekend, uh, then so be it. Uh, you know, there's some smart people out there that can come up with some pretty good schedules. The problem they don't have is, is what date this starts. And until you have that date, all of this is just kind of speculation. All right, so we're, we're both obviously – quarantine like uh, they're asking everybody to do social distancing i know that you're a sports fan and you know there's no sports to watch absolutely nothing so how do you spend your time what are you doing for 24 hours well it's you know i'm doing a lot of cleaning around the house i'm doing the floors i'm doing the doorknobs i'm, I'm definitely uh you know uh, mr clean around the house so i've, I've uh, got some some products that i've researched and doing floor cleaning right now today so it's really the simplest of things. We really all are in this boat together. It's a day-to-day -day activity. What do we need to do to get by today? I know you have kids. I have an eight-year-old trying to uh, entertain him, thinking about uh, school projects, connecting him with his, his classmates to try to ease the burden and the anxiety that these young children are having right now. You know, overall mental health. I, I think you've seen me, Michael. I'm involved with... Uh, a group called the Mosaic Mental Health Group in the Bronx that uh, is a phone call away. Uh, look up Mosaic Mental Health in the Bronx, uh, Mosaic H, um, um, MH, mosaicmh.org. And if you need somebody to talk to, uh, they're there. They have a hotline you can call. So, yeah, I mean, that's where we are is uh, kind of just getting through this from a mental health standpoint, making sure our children are okay, and, uh, you know, riding this thing out is, is – trying to be as good a citizen as you can be and do the right thing. I'll tell you what, David, I know that there, there's always been a stigma attached if, if you say, you know what, I'm hurting mentally. You could have a bad arm, but you can also have a bad brain. And I got to tell you, I'm filled with anxiety during these times and nervous and fearful. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I wonder if you're feeling the same way. Absolutely. You know, I worry about, I worry about my, my son, you know, who's eight years old. How do you explain this? You know, and, and you as well, Michael, with your children. How do you tell the? How do you talk to Charlie about this situation? You know, what is this? What is happening? Why we need to do these things uh, differently now? Why we have to stay home? Why can't he go to school? And you know, trying to figure out ways uh, to connect uh, these kids with their classmates. And uh, you know, we're doing this right now on Zoom. Uh, that's exactly what I'm doing with my son, getting him on Zoom with some of his classmates on a daily basis, trying to to line up tutors or trying to line up some way to uh, ease his anxiety and continue uh, with, his, with his learning curve and trying to, to keep him entertained and, and going in the right direction, but also at the same time, easing the anxiety because you see it come out of your kids every now and then when they don't understand what's going on, they kind of lash out. You, you can tell, you can see it in them. And that's probably my biggest worry right now. Now, I know you're also very close with your dad who's up there in years. Do you worry about him? Because that's why we all have to stay in, because hopefully people of our age that are in decent shape, you could survive it if, God forbid, you got it. But you got to keep it away from older people. So how much is that a concern for you? Well, it's a huge concern for me because my dad has rheumatoid arthritis, which is an, kind of an immune uh, deficiency disease in and of itself. So, you know, he's one of those guys. He's in his mid-80s. His immune system is compromised. He was at the the highest risk level for, for this sort of a thing uh, because of his immune system. So, yeah, I mean, you, know, you talk about the sweet spot of worry. I mean, uh, he checks all the boxes as far as that goes. But so far, so good. Uh, he, you know, he has uh, stayed inside. And uh, when he does go outside, it's all by himself to get some sunshine and take a walk. And uh, just finding that right balance of, uh, you know, how you're supposed to live your life has, has become 
so difficult for a lot of people, but so far so good. He's doing fine. Thanks for asking, Mike. Well, send my best to him. He's such a great guy. So let, let's talk a little uh, sports. The, the, the sports that's keeping my radio show alive right now is Tom Brady. So obviously you've done the team to team bit and you were traded a lot. You signed as a free agent. Can you understand Tom Brady actually saying, I'm going to leave New England, a comfort zone for 20 years? You know, I really can. Uh, you know, sometimes you, your judgment gets clouded and, and sometimes ego gets in the way. And, you know, I, I'm no Tom Brady, but, you know, you, you know, Michael, my last year with the Yankees in 2000, I really fell on my face and had a really rough year. And during the off season, if I would have bitten my pride a little bit, I probably could have come back to the Yankees on a much lower deal and with no guarantee to even make the team or have a shot to be the fifth starter. And, and I kind of uh, let my ego get in the way. And uh, in negotiations, I had a couple of chances with Texas and Boston, and they came pretty hard and made me feel pretty good about myself. So I ended up signing with Boston. And in retrospect, all these years later, more than 20 years later, I, I kind of missed uh, not staying with the Yankees. And maybe I could have stayed and, and swallowed my pride just a little bit. Uh, you know, it, it's a blip on the screen now, as, as I say, as I tell this story all these years later. But I can certainly empathize with Tom Brady and what he's going through. And a lot of times players at that point in their career, you, you just really want to be wanted. And you want to hear a team or a front office talk to you that way and say, hey, we need you, we want you. And it sounds like that wasn't what he was hearing from his own coach and his own organization, which, which led him to that decision. Now, you're the perfect guy to ask this because, you know, all the people that we spoke to on the radio show about Brady, former teammates, they said that Damian Woody, for one guy, said, you know, he, it, you don't have fun in New England. It's all about winning. That's all it's about. Now, you probably had more fun with the Mets, but you won so much more with the Yankees. Do you understand the dichotomy there? And is winning something that makes all the hard work pay off? Well, I think so. I think Ruben Sierra said something similar back in the Yankees in the mid '80s or mid '90s. So, you know, they don't care about anything but winning. So, yeah, I mean, that Yankee group of the '90s was very professional and uh, maybe even a little bit boring at times. And, you know, it was a, we were a product of our era and how we were raised, and it's a different time nowadays. And certainly having fun mean something and yeah it's more entertaining for the fans you know and hence why we have the back flips now and certain certain liberties are taken now that that were kind of frowned upon years ago i, I think it's all good for the game uh but there is nothing better nothing more fun than winning you know at the end being the last team the last team standing i mean you know michael i'm i'm so thankful for the championships that i had with the yankees and the one i had with the blue jays and Every year I get further removed from those championship years, the more I appreciate it because people remember those championship teams. People remember that 98 Yankees team. People remember that 96 Yankees team that broke through, and I'm so thankful to be a part of that. So I still think, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, I'll take all business and let's, let's be all about winning over, you know what, let's have a family fun atmosphere and let's all, you know, let's all get a trophy. <laughs> it's interesting though because the Yankees obviously are all business and George Steinbrenner always felt that if you didn't win a World Series you'd failed that year but Joe Torre I thought took some of the edge off because he wasn't a dictator he, he doesn't seem like he was Bill Belichick did that take some of the edge off of having to win uh, yeah I think it did Joe Torre was the right guy at the right time and uh, he handled everything so well and acted as the buffer. I mean, there were a lot of situations with our owner, George Steinbrenner, that never got to the clubhouse because Joe Torre would cut it off at the pass and, and keep, it, keep it from us. And, um, he, you know, he also allowed us to police ourselves in the clubhouse. We had a good dynamic of veteran players that kind of ran that clubhouse together. So it was the perfect dynamic. You had, a, you had a, an owner that uh, – would stop at nothing to win and would give us all the resources we needed. You had a manager who uh, knew how to deal with a very tough and very stringent owner, and you had a clubhouse full of veterans that knew how to police themselves. So it was kind of the perfect storm there where we had fun. Believe me, behind the scenes, that team had a lot of fun. You know, maybe we were a little bit more guarded in public and a little more professional, or, but uh, don't think that, that we didn't have fun behind the scenes because we certainly did. All right, let's do our public service, David. Obviously, everybody who's watching this should know this, but please wash your hands. I tell you, David, 
I've never been a great hand washer. I've washed my hands more in the last two weeks than I've had my entire life. And obviously the social distancing is important. You got to listen to what people are telling you, what the doctors, what the science says, please, in order to flatten this curve, that's the only thing to do, David. Oh, I could not agree more. You know, you, you get a sense that moving forward, that uh, forever our lives are changed because we're so tuned into this right now. And, uh, you know, whether there's another coronavirus that comes down the pike in a few years or whatnot, or, or this is our future, you know, this, is, this has helped us prepare on how we move forward and how we collectively can make a dent in this thing. If we're all in together, we all buy into the plan that we can really uh, impact uh, how we deal with this as, as not only as a country, but as, and globally as a world together, that we all are in this together. And uh, uh, certainly I agree, Michael, it's, it's uh, moving forward. I, I, you know, the way we interact with people, the way we view hygiene, certainly I think has changed forever. Well, I wish I was with you Thursday in Baltimore, but soon enough we will be. Let me give you a Zoom elbow because that's the new thing. Nice. And I'll I'll talk to you real soon, buddy. Stay safe. All right, Michael. Good talking to you. All right.